Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now uh, if one wants to look at the forest policy for instance the Indian Forest Act of 1848 it happens to be you know a major blow to many of the tribal communities who are dependent on the customary use of forest and its products. Now if you single out zooming cultivation uh, it is primarily an agriculture practices. Now apart from that accessibility or using of uh, the free use of this forest is not just limited alone to uh, agriculture, but also people are dependent on the non-timber forest products like uh, they engage in uh, edible items of plants, root shrubs, so and so forth. So, uh, and, and, and again uh, many of these food items uh, enhances to the you know the caste or the in case income of these people because they uh, rely on the, these food items being gathered from the forest and then being sold in the market and then this enhances some sort of a security to the, to the people. Now if this kind of act uh, is in a way you know fully implemented or uh, being targeted to those uh, people who are dependent on the customary use of forests and its products. It, it not just only you know uh, uh, affects the means of livelihood, but the means of survival are at stake. Now the colonial rulers in a way implemented a system of these forestry management that uh, conflicted uh, with the traditional practices of the forest dwellers. Uh, for instance, the shifting cultiva cultivation, which was again intrinsic to the tribal way of living, and uh, which was considered as primitive and uh, unremunerative. Now, many of the uh, policies, uh, in a way, stem from this uh, policymakers' point of view, which regarded the uh, these tribal communities as primitive. And, and certain groups were even termed as savages and apes because of different pigmentation food habits which often included human flesh and others indicators of animality. Now this sort of stereotyping and labeling uh, you know a certain sections of community or group as you know uncivilized and primitive in a way is a ploy on the part of the uh, policy makers to you know uh, alter if not uh, rehabilitate them from this uh, uh, evil practices. So, these are some of the you know ideas which are pretty much embedded in the psyche of the uh, policy makers and uh, perhaps these, these are all because of the lacking of knowledge and the well-being of those communities. So, nobody really questioned or tends to understand how sustainably these communities that is those who practices uh, zoomings for generations were able to you know harmoniously establish uh, the kind of uh, you know in terms of managing their natural resources. So, this perhaps is something which needs to be you know debated. Now again uh, according to the national forest policy of uh, 1988 which is issued by the government of India one of the main reasons of the loss of forest cover in the hills is uh, because of the spread of fire uh, uh, which is pretty much a part of the techniques and methods in zoom cultivations which not only affects regeneration of catchment, but also wildlife species. So, this sort of blaming the blame game which is being branded upon these uh, Jumias 
is something which again is being enshrined in the national forest policy. Now, under this policy, new strategies for development and rehabilitation of the tribal populations in altering the zooming practices are being initiated. Now, again, this kind of policy is being done in the name of, you know, uh, preserving and restoring the environment stability and zoom cultivation has been labeled as uh, primitive practices. Now, what was evident uh, from this is that uh, uh, this creation of this social landscape that is legible to the state authority implied you know the uh, destruction of the informal non state structure of trust and cooperation. Now, James C. Scott have uh, come up with this notion because he uh, in a way uh, propound this idea of you know the uh, the civilization notion and then the uh, how uh, these communities are in a way considered to be evading the state or not wanting to come under the rule of the state because they do not want to conform in terms of uh, generating the revenue. Now, Magdorua who have uh, done an extensive study in Northeast in the uh, recent years uh, in his analysis of Northeast India again highlights that the mainstream Indian society has no you know hesitation in labeling the upland communities as primitive in the contemporary politics and development. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages in the context of this environmental sustainability? Now, uh, if you look at the studies made by uh, Kunglin, Geertz and Spencer and also Freeman, Werner and Ramakrishnan. Uh, and Kunglin perhaps is the first uh, to have you know studied shifting cultivation in a much more detailed analysis by trying to you know uh, look at the different kinds of data and the amount of you know food crops which are being planted so and so forth. So, perhaps the first credit of this uh, cultivation shifting cultivation goes to Kunglind and uh, and others followed. Now, they suggest that Sweden cultivation as a system of land use uh, does a minimal uh, you know effect or damage to the environment and can be you know successfully used as a rational system in marginal areas. Now, as a result of the kind of you know the hill terrain or the uh, steep areas, uh, the those communities who practices this Sweden cultivation have no choice, but they have to because uh, they don't have much of an access to the outside uh, technology. Now, and and in their detailed analysis and study, they come up with the conclusion that uh, it has a minimal damage to the environment and. Uh, it, it can have uh, it, it can be termed as a ra rational system and uh, perhaps maybe because of the diversity of species in the cropping system and also ensures conservation of precious minerals in the soil and capture solar energy through a perennial plant cover. So, herein comes again this idea of the agroforestry. Now, uh, the debate again is on how to situate uh, shifting cultivation, which, which is uh, not only an age old agriculture practices, but also which is intr intrinsically related to the culture and identity of those practicing it. Now, most ethnic uh, minorities which are regarded, uh, regarded it as you know a system in which uh, the quantities of agriculture products grown depend on the needs of the uh, cultivators that is maybe the family, the community so and so forth. For example, land that is communally owned is also communally cultivated and uh, the local organization is responsible for the distribution of the harvested agriculture products. So, herein comes the question of that idea of 
communitarianism and egalitarianism because the idea of hierarchy class division or maybe the idea of surplus does not arise. Now, such an approach which does not aim to make profit from the agriculture surplus tends to you know judiciously use natural resources and forests. So, in a way they tends to rely on the forest for their own basic needs and uh, they have that uh, guided by the ecological philosophy of you know causing a minimal harm to the resources because they tend to generate only their basic needs. Now, the local practices uh, to do with ecosystem and resource management uh, give this uh, indigenous group the experience to deal with uncertainty and unpredictability intrinsic to old ecosystem. So, therefore, this idea of environmental uh, uh, determinism or, 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 or the environmental possibilism both in a way tends to you know play uh, among these or in these local practices. Now, however, the emphasis on these modern methods of cultivation that is which is being pushed forward by the government policy makers have not only led to labeling the shifting cultiva cultivation as primitive used by the indigenous people, but also disregarding this traditional knowledge system and their capacity of improving the existing methods. Uh, these are something which also we have uh, come across while discussing uh, the indigenous knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge. So, I am just uh, merely trying to link up with those concepts. And if you look at most government policies tends to you know question the feasibility of uh, shifting cultivation and urge many of those communities uh, to you know undertake the uh, uh, terrace cultivation. Now, the idea or differences between uh, the terrace cultivation which is much more stable and uh, permanent uh, has to be in a way uh, being an option or optional to those jumias. Now, the question is can jhum cultivation be an effective and self sufficient method that does not damage the environment. Perhaps this question has led uh, scholars and policy makers to propose alternatives such as terrace and settle cultivation and one of the policy behind uh, terrace cultivation is that uh, it increase water retention and ability through terracing results in a higher agriculture output uh, that obtained uh, than, than that obtained in the shifting cultivation, because shifting cultivation is seen to be much more labor extensive and the output is slow. So, that sort of you know comparison between the two has uh, made a conclusion or uh, propagated by the state uh, policy makers to you know opt for terrace cultivation. Now, the issues of this land and property relations and land use under this shifting cultivation is commonly owned, but land under terrace cultivation can be used as a commodity because it can be owned individually. Now, therefore, one needs to you know uh, look at the idea of this ownership, because once this terrace cultivation comes into uh, practice or, or being adopted, the idea of this commodity that is uh, which can be sold and plates. So, this idea of individualism uh, emerges and uh, the idea of this uh, communitarian or egalitarian in a way will be you know. Uh, will become redundant. Now, uh, the concept of Jumia, uh, if you look at the historical uh, account which is given by Scott, this Jumia is a term uh, which is coined by uh, William Van Schendel and uh, what he talks about is that why most ethnic communities in the hilled regions of Thailand, Cambodia, India and China uh, are in a way you know engaging in this sort of evading the state. He argues that 
an estimate of uh, roughly about 100 million people who live in this region, you know, uh, have fled into the hills to avoid taxation that is the revenue which is st still much you know come into uh, practice right from the colonial period and also they want to avoid the slavery indentured labor war and other you know negative corolla corollaries of the state uh, including famines and epidemics they remain the world's largest refugee population that lies in the shadow of the state which is which doesn't come under the purview of the state uh, governance now the measures to contain this zoom cultivation in a way have uh, you know created economic uncertainties for these ethnic minorities and settled cultivation has forced them to you know assimilate into the national economy or the state economy which in a way can be you know uh, levite certain kind of revenues. Now, there are also scholars who criticize the concept of this state led development as a tool for civilizing the margins. Now, uh, this group of scholars or school of thought has argued that the development policies are aimed at those sections of society that are regarded as you know uncivilized, backward, primitive, savages and by those initiating the part of development by comparative analysis among various groups and uh, parameters such as the physical appearance, industrialization, agriculture techniques and settlement patterns. Now, what are the kind of policy which is being uh, witnessed uh, against zoom cultivation? The government uh, has time and again initiated that terrace cultivation in the zoom control program in a way has failed to provide adequate income to the zoomias. This is also partly seen in the context of the Riangs in the Tripura state and partly because the state initiative has failed uh, that uh, it has in a way uh, resulted to the widening gap between the rich and the poor because the part uh, as in terrace cultivation it is individually owned and it is sort of a private property which can be in a way sold. So, the one who has uh, a much more upper hand in terms of you know cash or power has you know um, and uh, unlimited way of expansion of their agricultural land. And, and so is the accumulation of wealth because they it, it relies on surplus. Now, unlike the settled or this uh, terrace cultivation, zoom cultivation again is pretty much diversified and produce mixed crops and, and which we talk about the self sustenance. Now, settled cultivation again is seen as an alternative to this zoom cultivation does not you know uh, seem to have uh, to be very efficient. It has in a way disrupted the egalitarian tribal society of uh, Jumias and it, it has uh, uh, no clear advantage because it requires a large capital investment because uh, you have to rely on you know external agencies like the technology maybe tractors and fertilizer so and so forth. So, so it, it is sort of uh, a huge investment for those uh, who are switching over to the settled agriculture. And the basic reason why zoom cultivation has been uh, you know uh, rejected by the policy maker is the declining land man ratio and reduction in the zoom follow cycle. And uh, one of the differences between this uh, terrace and uh, zoom cultivation is that while uh, one engages uh, the former engages in the commercialized agriculture and the latter centers on self sustenance or self consumption to you know uh, have an adequate supply for the basic needs. Now, the human labor and seeds are the only two investment in zoom cultivation and it is apt that the Jumias grows crops for self consumption. Now, apart from the human labor and seeds, 
there's no other investment which is required. But on the contrary, in settled cultivation, it requires a capital and non-capital investment. Such investment options may not be available to the jumias, which in a way, you know, compel them to, you know, uh, borrow money from the organized and un unorganized sectors or work as laborers or in farms. This reduces their self-sufficiency, but also pose an uh, economic burden to them because they have to borrow money and you know how the local money lenders uh, operate and how they operationalize. Because uh, the local farmers tend to you know accumulate or borrowed money and uh, with the interest it goes on. So, eventually when the time for this harvesting come, uh, they have to you know bore the brunt of those the interest and the capitals. So, there is nothing really left at the end because all the products are being sold off to pay off their debt. So, they become sort of adapter. Now, zooming is in a way uh, considered to be a misconception because zooming cultivation forms uh, an integral part of the tribal lifestyle. It is not just a means of livelihood, but also the entire socio-cultural religious activities are interwoven into the different stages of uh, cultivation uh, uh, or the agriculture cycle. It may be therefore unwise to you know evaluate Sweden cultivation in merely a pure economic terms as this narrow approach fails to capture the full significance of its merits and most of the government policy initiatives are based on the economic evaluation of Sweden culture have in a way been uh, geared towards discouraging its practices. Now, opposing and shifting cultivation is merely based on this kind of mis, uh, misconception. Now, uh, you can perhaps look at the feasibility of shifting cultivation, uh, what are the kind of uh, the different disciplines have different ideas and opinions regarding this and scholars have uh, opposing ideas and uh, their own uh, perspective. So, the best way to you know uh, look at uh, zooming in a words much more uh, uh, the feasibility is to also take into account the uh, socio-culture background of those who are practicing. It, it should not be merely based on the idea of uh, the economic perspective, but different sorts of uh, needs to be taken care of. Now, maybe uh, this is the present scenario of how this traditional form practices is seen to be unsustainable by the policy makers and uh, uh, different uh, practitioners. Now, uh, maybe if you look at uh, some of these references, you can have much more wider understanding of how uh, shifting cultivation, the kind of debate which emerges and the controversies and perhaps one way of looking at it is uh, trying to trace the historical background of how the policies are being framed and uh, the advantages and disadvantages and the debates of how shifting cultivation has can be contextualized and situated by taking into account the uh, socio-cultural uh, background of those communities practicing it.